Welcome to the Raising Cinephiles podcast, a show about passing on your love of cinema to the next generation. I'm your host, Jessica Cantor, and I have worked in all facets of the entertainment industry for the last 20 years and recently became a mom. Always remember that myself and guests are speaking from personal experience and not giving parenting advice. Let's go ahead and dive into the episode. I am here today with Monica Levinson, a film and television producer whose most recent film, Old Dads, is currently streaming on Netflix and has done some incredible films, including the Borat films and Wander Darkly, which I loved. I'm so excited to have you here today. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, Wander Darkly is a very special film. Yes, I think I saw it premiere. Yeah. Oh, did you? At Sundance? Oh, yeah. That That was a movie where... That was a time where we got to see the movie in the theater and hear the audience reaction. And I remember having a hard time, a difficult time catching my breath because there's a lot of tears in that movie. And I just remember hearing the audience react to it was really special. Yeah. And why we, I think, make movies and why we do it. I hope we can get those communal experiences still. Yes, I, I 100% agree. So we'll get into my first question, which is what is your first movie memory? My first movie memory probably is not the first movie I saw in a theater, but probably the early days of watching Laserdisc or VHS tapes of Fiddler on the Roof, because it was seeing what my ancestors, I'm Jewish, and I think it was seeing what my ancestors probably had some version of experiencing and my family absolutely loved that movie and probably Mm -hmm. because they were seeing you know their relatives on screen Mm -hmm. sort of like my grandparents were born in the United States but their parents never spoke about the old country quote unquote so I think that really was satisfied what we thought it was like always having to leave their homes and go to the next place and not necessarily all of it, but it certainly reflected a familial feeling. Yeah. I I actually have an early memory of seeing the play mm-hmm. of Fiddler on the Roof before the movie, actually. I don't think I saw the movie until I was a bit older, but I did see it. And yeah, it's a it it it's a special film. But it just felt like watching your grandparents and it did have exactly. that blanket of that. Exactly. And I I did see the play as well on Broadway. And maybe I'm combining the two memories, but that that definitely was early days, along with Mel Brooks films with my parents laughing because they also use Yiddish words and they use he was he would always incorporate something. You felt like you were watching your people in some way where it's it's nice to have something reflected on screen of that was that reminded you of your family. Yeah. And what was the ritual for your family seeing movies? We weren't big movie theater people. That really, my mother loved taking us to the theater and we would go, I was born and raised in Washington, D.C., but we would go to the Kennedy Center in D.C. and see ballets and plays and go up to New York all the time and see theater. So movies were mostly on television for us growing Mm -hmm. up and we would all sit on the couch and laugh but we would go to occasional movies and but just not as much as watching television yeah yeah I I, it's definitely like a the bigger the family the less outings happen yes right (laughs) exactly (laughs) that's a theme that I've heard of like yeah I, I spoke with Carrie Coon and she was like yeah I had five siblings we didn't go anywhere <laughs> right well we did do Christmas day was always at the movies and we would get a big group of us that would go yeah. and see movies I remember seeing Malcolm X on Christmas oh, day wow. at the movie theater I mean obviously I was an adult at that point or at yes. least college age or something but that's a proper Jewish Christmas yes <laughs> movies and Chinese food right exactly exactly <laughs> Yeah, I recently I actually brought 
a friend of mine who was away from his family and didn't have Christmas plans. I was like, do you want to do a Jewish Christmas? And so we went to San Gabriel Valley, had dumplings, and then went to a screening of something. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. I used to do like three movies a day with my friends in LA. It was my, my family it became my LA family ritual yeah. along with, I have a, a brunch in the mornings for everybody. So That's we would funny. do brunch and then head to the movies for the day and night. Yeah. Oh, that's so great. And so if you grow up going to the movie theater, but you're watching them, when, when did you know you wanted to work in this business? Well, I was in high school and I was editor of my yearbook. So we were sent to Ohio, Cleveland, Ohio, maybe for a yearbook convention. And there it was my senior year of high school. They screened for us the movie White Nights, which was with Barishnikov and Gregory Hines. Mm -hmm. And I had seen Barishnikov dance. So I was a big fan because of my mother taking us to the Kennedy Center. And so it was really exciting to see that movie. And afterwards, Gregory Hines actually came out to talk to us about the movie. And it was a Q&A. And I was so mesmerized by him talking about the making of the movie. And I don't know that I had really ever thought about that before like people that actually worked in the industry and the making of the movies and it just clicked in that moment I remember being very interested and feeling like that that feels like what I want to do so I went to tell I went to school at Syracuse for tv radio film management and but I didn't know that I could actually work in the film business so because I'm from DC, I thought that's where I'm going to be. That's where all my family is. That's where everybody stays. Maybe New York for a few years, but DC. So mm -hmm. I came home and I worked in television news and that was, but it was entertainment based television news because we were working with entertainment tonight as well in DC as their DC bureau. So we got to go to a couple behind the scenes on movie shoots after college and when I was an intern and that was another moment of eye-opening mm -hmm. and so when I decided that I had learned what I could from TV news I started trying to figure out how to get into film and there were a few films at the time which was really great and I don't know that many films go to DC now but there were several films coming to DC to shoot and I was lucky enough to get on one of those which was Pelican Brief. Oh wow <laughs> yeah it's an amazing film so that was the beginning of my career. I, I was, I'd gone to New York and interned on the movie, The Paper. I just called until somebody would pick up the phone. And this woman, Trish Hoffman, who was a friend, but she was an art department coordinator at the time. And she didn't know me from anything, but she just said, fine, fine. You keep calling, just come up and intern for us for a couple of weeks. And I did that until I couldn't afford it any longer. And then I had that on my resume to get Pelican Brief. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I love hearing stories, how people get started because there's really no, no one way. And no. the only consistent thing I hear is perseverance. Yes. <laughs> I'm exactly. like just calling. I remember in New York, there was a temp agency and they placed in film and TV and a friend told me about it. And I called him every day. And he got me my first job at Sony. That's like, amazing. Yeah. And in New York. And I, that was, but I literally called him every day and he loved it. He was like, she wants it. So I, I feel good putting her, putting her in that job. Exactly. And that's, I think Trish felt the same. And I said, okay, I'm taking the train. Like I literally came up, put my suitcase out the door, outside the door of the office um, in the building so they wouldn't see that I just come up from DC and <laughs> put it outside went to work and then found friends to sleep on couches but it was just like I have to do this I have to do yeah. it yeah and you're based in LA you I'm in LA, LA now yeah, yeah. So, so I did well, learn that LA was where I had to be but yeah. I worked in New York for several years I did two movies in DC but in between, I went out of town and I went to New York. This woman, Celia Costas, hired and kept me on Pelican Brief and, and Jamie Boscari Martin, who's my best friend. But she, Celia and Jamie are two of my closest friends still. And I met them on Pelican Brief. But Celia was the line producer. And so she continued taking me onto shows in New York. And then about five years into my New York days, I realized that I wanted to be where the projects originated mm -hmm. and not be where things came because of location. And yeah. so, and I only, I wasn't part of the independent 
world at that time. I was only part of the studio system. So mm -hmm. it, I didn't know from the independent world in New York. So I, I packed up and went to LA and knew about three people and mm -hmm. I've been here for 25 years. That's amazing. So you do a lot of ad advocacy work in the industry. So yeah. I was wondering if you could speak to how you got involved in that, why that's important to you. Well, I think that's always been a part of my life. My parents have always been supporters of causes and chair events and just constantly volunteer their time or, or speak out about four causes. So I think it was just came naturally to me. And when opportunities were presented, I got involved. So that's number one, which is part of who, how I was raised. But number yeah. two, I just, I like helping people that may not have the same opportunities or may not know how to get involved or how to move forward in the industry or just where I can be of service, where I can lend a hand and give my knowledge. I like to do so. Yeah. I, I'm going to name it because I feel like it's important, but Takun alum, right? Yeah. That's, that's what we're taught in Jewish school and Jewish community, it's giving back to the community that we're in. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah. So I'm on the executive board of women in film. I just co-chaired our annual gala. This Amazing. was the second year in the row, which was great. It was so nice. And that, that really gives us our, the money that pays for all the programs in women in film for the year. So that gala is really important each year. And yeah, I'm on the Academy Producers Branch Executive Board, which has really been exciting and a pleasure to be a part of. That was like a lifelong dream to get into the Academy. And then, <laughs> so now I'm like, okay, now what can I do? How can I help? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's been fun. And I try to mentor through their programs and through Women in Film. Amazing. Yeah. I, I have to get more involved with Women in Film. I had an interesting experience when I was younger with them. I think it's a completely different group now, but I had a, a newsletter called Film News Briefs that I ended up selling to Studio System and I broke down the news every week. And then I wanted to expand my programming at the time. So it was the beginning of YouTube and Vimeo. And, and I saw there were some beautiful short films and filmmakers coming up that nobody was in the like, industry proper where there was no bridge between those worlds yet. And so I would find four fi short films and filmmakers that I thought was beautiful and create a monthly newsletter and I would put, they were unwrapped. I would put their email addresses and I would send it out. And I still have filmmakers that say they got 15, 20 meetings off of that email, Incredible, which was awesome. But I would get these scathing emails from women in film saying there was no women. Uh, and I honestly didn't even look at people's genders. I just picked things I thought were beautiful. I didn't. So I was, I, 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 it really turned me off because I was like, look, I'm happy to feature women. I want to feature women. Just send them to me. <laughs> totally. I don't yeah. know. I'm not I mean, finding them. That's, that's really sad and upsetting. And I think that the organization has changed a lot. I remember also not feeling um, welcome or included several years ago when I first started looking at women in film, not feeling like it was for me. Mm -hmm. And my friend, Amy Bear, she was my producing partner on Brian Banks and we became dear friends and she was becoming the next president. And I said, oh, well, that's great. I mean, maybe it will be great with you. And she was <laughs> like, you need to, you need to come and be involved. And uh, between she and Kirsten Schaefer, it's really just an incredible organization now. And so I'm really proud to be a part of it. Awesome. So come yeah. back. I'll come back. I'll give it another shot. <laughs> yes. I think it's important to speak to that. So other people can hear that organization shift and change based on leadership okay. and, and the environment, I think. Well, and, and for us, I mean, listen, I work with a ton of men in the industry and my whole career has been working with men. I have worked with women as producing partners and directors more recently, and it's been incredible. But even with Obviously, I worked with women and with Celia and Jamie from the early mm -hmm. days, but but it's so important to have men out there being advocates and collaborators and supporters because there's no way to move forward without everybody working together. So yeah. I don't see I, a world that works that way. Uh, we want to be parity, not, um, you know, we're not looking for domination. Exactly. And I have to say... <laughs> so, 
earlier in my career, it was the men actually that supported me more than the women. There was the women of a certain generation that didn't see there was room for more of us. Yep. And I'm so happy to see that that's shifted, that we're really lifting each other up and there's room for all of us. That kind of idea has really per- permeated our community. Absolutely. That was one of the things that at the, the other night, people asked me, how was the event? And I said, it was so nice to be in a room where everybody was excited to see each other. They all, you felt accepted. You felt like you belonged. You felt inspired by each other. And it, it was just this small world of 600 people, mostly women. I'd mm-hmm. say that was like 95% women in that room, just lifting each other up and inspiring each other. So I absolutely feel like there's a shift because, I mean, luckily I had Celia in my early days and at my TV news job, it was two mm-hmm. women as well that were my bosses, but, you know, I felt it in the industry. I felt it that the men, Stuart Kornfeld, who was Ben Stiller's producing partner, but Ben gave me, Ben and Stuart gave me opportunities and Sasha and Danny, Danny Goldberg, mm-hmm. who was wonderful. He gave me opportunities and Jay Roach. So yes, yeah, so a lot yeah. of men. Yeah. And, and I think, but also Betty Thomas, who is an incredible female director and she really, she gave me two, we worked together on two films and, and tried to give me some opportunities along the way that didn't work out for various reasons, but yeah. Yeah. It's uh, anyone who opens a door is just, it's so appreciated when I always try to do the same on the other side when, whenever I can, like, I'm always so proud when I like early days when I I think I was 23 and I had interns who were 21. So it was like, it felt like I was in like my peers were my my interns as an assistant. And like one of my interns ended up becoming like the head of Bleecker Street Films. And I'm like, I was there at the beginning. Andrew Carpin? Andrew Carpin? No, he's head of acquisitions or, and I don't know what his title is now. Kent? Kent. Sanderson? Yeah. Kent Sanderson. (laughs) Yeah. I did. I had several movies with Bleecker Street. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, he was my intern. I and I was um, Deborah Schindler's assistant at Sony, which great. I think Amy Bear was one of the other execs then yeah, when I was an assistant. And I, I stepped more into the indie world after being in this in the studio world and always sat in my own digital room because I was always ahead with technology. And so I play with that and now incorporating it in my traditional storytelling. That's fantastic. That that was sort of me with my TV news as well, mm-hmm. because I worked in digital to start mm-hmm. with TV news. And then mm-hmm. when I was working on Zoolander, well, actually, yeah, I guess Zoolander was the first one where I had to veer off into the more creative world as far as instead of production. And I had these other units and I basically didn't know how to do it for no money. And so Ben and I spoke about it and said, okay, I'm going to use digital since it's going to be just on TV screens. I'm going to go and we'll shoot it digitally and it will be much less expensive. We'll mm-hmm. shoot it on like little beta cameras or whatever. And we went out and did a lot of that work in a very scrappy, scrappy manner. The VH1 Fashion Awards packages, mm-hmm. male model of the year packages. And, and then I took it to, I took it out of the traditional edit room and took it over to Hollywood Digital, I think, and Marcy Jastro, who was there yes. at the time. She, oh, Marcy. <laughs> yes, she's amazing. And so she and I sat down and we were like, okay, I need an editor who can put these packages together in a, in a more of an MTV VH1 style as opposed mm-hmm. to my traditional editing. And so did that starting at the, because I understood it from TV news. Yeah. And now that's like how you make movies, right? It's exactly. all that workflow. <laughs> exactly. It was like so crazy that I went over the weekend or last week and picked up a film print, which is still in my car right now. And it brought me back to my first year when I was in NYU post 9-11, it was the first Tribeca Film Festival. And I volunteered and my job was print trafficking. Like I would pick up the prints and move them between the different projection rooms. And I was like, I was so bummed with that job. because I was like, I don't get to be on the red carpet. I don't do it. <laughs> and now looking back, I'm like, that was the coolest job. Ever. Yes, you got to play with film. I know. Yeah. It's so crazy. When we had the premiere of Bruno, we had a scene that was with Michael, it was with Janet Jackson. Mm-hmm. But the day of the premiere, it was the day that Michael Jackson died. 
And so the piece in Bruno didn't work anymore. We could not screen that. And I was sitting there getting my hair done. I was like, okay, it's finally all behind me. Marketing is taking care of the premiere. Whereas with Borat, I had to help with the premieres as well because we had these events. Mm -hmm. Sasha would always come in dressed in character. So, So this was like, I got it, I'm done. And then I'm listening to the news. I'm hearing it while I'm getting my hair done. I'm like, no. <laughs> and not because I wasn't upset that Michael Jackson died. Obviously, there was it was there's different feelings about that. But the scene could not stay in the premiere that night. Mm. And I called Marcy and I said, okay, how do we change the DCP? She's like, you can't. It's going to take 24 hours to redo the DCP. And luckily, we had, it was still the time in 2000 and nine that we had film prints so we had film print backups for all the dcps that Mm -hmm. night so the editor went in and cut the one piece out of the film where we ask where we have janet jackson in it where he has it's a it's a piece right after the paul abdul uh, part of the movie but anyway so there's this chunk that was taken out and excised for the premiere but only because we had film and only because we had a print could we actually just go in and do that and then we called because there were premieres happening in new zealand and australia and the uk with all the u.s territories and we called and we said okay you all have only film prints you need to cut at this mark to mark this mark. So I was like, so thankful and grateful that we had film <laughs> still. Yeah. Now you would never be able to do that. We would never well, have a film backup. You can make a DCP pretty fast now. Yeah, at the time in 2009, yeah. it was 24 no, hours. It was 24 hours. I'm like, now yeah. we probably could fix it digitally. Like, at exactly least I how, I, how we could do it. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> like maybe it would affect like, like the affect some of the other parts but but this was three o'clock in the afternoon and the premiere was at seven so yeah yeah. it was it would have been real time plus the edit plus the whatever to wrap it so we were definitely lucky yeah that's amazing I love that story I was speaking with a friend of mine who's an emerging female producer who's got done a couple great films and she's like I really want to make something on film and I was looking into it and it's just so expensive (laughs) It's so expensive. And actually in 2010, I did my last film on film mm-hmm. and the director said, please, 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 please. We're, I'm never going to chance get a chance to make something on film again. I'll never, I have never made something on film. Please let me do it. And so I said, fine, we'll do it. And he was so bummed. He was so bummed because the latitude that you have in film for your color correction, mm-hmm. the the size of the monitors that we could really see the image to make sure the focus was okay. There were just certain things that he didn't have to worry about with digital and mm-hmm. that he, he was like, I don't understand. I can't really see. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I know, I'm sorry. This is just the way it is. With this film. is yeah. film. So he, I don't think ever asked to do another movie on film after that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm like really interested in that Kodak eight millimeter. Cause I think there is something to pausing and taking a moment for each shot that we're losing with digital that like Mm -hmm. that real and you know some filmmakers still do it but I think they have a background with film and and the younger generation I just don't see that composition in the same way that pause and I hope in film schools they they still teach that (laughs) yeah I mean truly it's it's gonna be a lost art form yeah Well, I want to ask a little bit about your nieces and nephews and being some, like, as I understand, you're one of the few in your family that is in the industry. Is that correct? I'm the only person in my family. Yeah. Okay. I didn't want to totally make that assumption, but it seemed that way from the storytelling. (laughs) Yes. And so you're the one who probably tells people what to see, like what's coming out and get to introduce your nieces and nephews to your passion. So Tell me about that. My nieces and nephews are not, they they watch a ton of reality television. Mm-hmm. My youngest niece, Alexandra, she loves the theater and she loves movies, but she'll keep watching Mamma Mia over and over again. She's 13, 14 now. 
but it was really cool because my niece who was doing her semester in Copenhagen, she's a junior in college, my oldest niece, she called me when I was shooting in London. So we were on better time zones. So she Mm -hmm. could call me when she couldn't call her mother. And so it was really nice, but she said, okay, I need suggestions for movies to watch, like romantic comedies to watch. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I was like, this is my chance. So I'm so (laughs) excited to give her a list. And I was like, okay, have you seen? Because I knew there were more recent ones that she had seen. So I was like, you need to watch Four Weddings and a Funeral. You need to watch, I was like, you must have seen Bridget Jones's Diary. And she's like, no, I haven't. I was like, okay, you need to watch. So there was just different (laughs) movies that I was sending her. And I don't think she watched any of them. I think they found like <laughs> some Ryan Reynolds movie that they had seen already that they just put on. But yeah. so I really do try. I really do try. And I'll try to put things on. We all, I was home uh, at some point in DC for at some point over the summer. So we went to see Barbie together oh. and she totally enjoyed it. And it was great to watch it with her. But they also, they've been discovering my movies, which has been fun because mm-hmm. my nephew decided dodgeball with his favorite movie of all time. And oh. that was when he was like nine years old. So I got to bring him. It was really exciting. Ben did a charity event on the Today Show. This was probably in 2012, maybe 2011. So I got to bring him up to watch from the, I was, we were going to watch from the, on the plaza, the Today Show. Mm-hmm. And so that, and he would get to meet Ben and Justin Long and a couple other people that were going to be there. And Ben saw him and I bought him like the Globo Gym or the Purple Cobras, whatever it was called. God, I'm blanking. But anyway, I bought him the the t-shirt and the mm-hmm. armbands. Mm-hmm. And Ben saw him in the green room and said, hey, what are you doing here? And I said, it's one of my nephew. He's a big fan. He said, oh, well, you should play with us. And my nephew ended up getting to play dodgeball. <laughs> with the Today Show and Ben and Justin. And it was so great. It was just the best day. Yeah. And, um, what an amazing experience. You're definitely yes. the cool aunt, huh? Yes. I got to be the cool aunt. And I know my my youngest niece would love to be an actress. And she's like, is there anything? I'm like, no, I'm not encouraging this behavior of being an actress <laughs> in film. But but she came and visited me on set in London this summer. Yeah. There was a bat mitzvah trip that we we owed her so she went to London and Paris with my mom and I joined them for that while I was short but they came to set in London which was great but yeah I mean as far as giving them movies to watch it's just I try yeah I try (laughs) try. yes definitely and something I want I thought of while you were telling me about watching Mel Brooks as a kid and you're naming these films and I feel like they're Ben Stiller and and Sasha and these men I feel like are extensions of that early totally. days and I'm just curious if if there is a link in in your taste from a young age from what you're exposed to to what you're making I mean I love comedy I've always loved comedy I like being moved by by films and television and so whether that's comedy or drama I'm not a horror person that's another kind of movement but you know but I like that feeling of being moved Mm -hmm. and and comedy from an early age was something that my family really loved and I remember my first like adult book was my dad was reading the biography of Jack Benny Mm -hmm. and I read that at like I don't know seven or eight years old (laughs) I remember reading this book about like an old time actor and comedian. So yeah, I definitely, I mean, I, I didn't get a chance in my early days to choose my films. And so I was lucky enough to, well, actually the first comedy I worked on was Private Parts, the Howard Stern movie. Mm -hmm. And Celia had gotten, Celia, my old boss, Celia Costas, she had gotten the opportunity. She went to LA to have two meetings. One was for Titanic and one was for private parts. And she said, we're not doing private parts. And I said, we're doing, we need to do private parts. Like private parts is Howard Stern. She's like, I, I'm not really a big fan, Monica. And I made her read the book on the, on the plane there. And she said, she laughed out loud. She was, you know, she had to like hide the book because it was embarrassing for be holding a book that said private parts, but she was covering it up and laughing the whole way there. Had a great meeting with Betty Thomas and Danny Goldberg. And came home and said, okay, well, I had a great meeting on Titanic, had a great meeting on, on private parts. And I said, 
we have to do private parts. And, you know, <laughs> she would be like retired and so wealthy if she had done Titanic, but we <laughs> had the best life experience by yeah. doing private parts. So I guess <laughs> I led my path to comedy in that mm-hmm. way. And then I think because of that movie, Zoolander came to Celia and she brought me on. And then after that, I just kept talking to the, the comedy guys. Yeah. Yeah, I am. Um, and I feel like there isn't, I haven't, maybe you know that I don't know because you're, you're in comedy, but I haven't seen like a younger generation of these, of comedians making those kinds of movies. I mean, I know it's tricky now with being canceled and saying the wrong thing and comedy is hard. And I want to talk about that with old dads a little bit, because that's a theme in there. Definitely. Well, I think with, yeah, I mean, you're right. There's not a newer generation, but I mean, obviously Seth Rogen was the generation below me Mm -hmm. that was making that were when Jonah and Danny McBride, Mm -hmm. you know, he's obviously making incredible television with the righteous gemstones Mm -hmm. and that group. But yeah, the, the, the next generation down the 20, 20 and 30 year olds, I I haven't seen much. The team behind search party, maybe. Yeah. That show. Yeah. Yeah. Like that, that one had me laughing out loud in ways I wasn't expecting. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I, I I have to say I'm remiss in watching it, but yes, I've heard great things. Yeah. Yeah. So we didn't, I'm, I'm, I want to talk a little bit about old ads because we have that. That's why you're Thanks. here. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I'll ask you my last question. I want to keep us on, on schedule. Um, so yeah. Tell me about how that, that movie came to you and, and it's, I, I saw it over, over Thanksgiving and it's both like, hysterical and wildly offensive at the same time (laughs) exactly well I I'm a big Bill Burr fan Mm -hmm. I like comedy I love stand-up comedy and I find that craft when done well is just so exciting to watch and one of the things Bill does so well is he can almost like walk a tightrope and you start to think he's maybe talking about you and you start to get slightly offended and then he's able to swing it to the other side and then you're laughing again and then laughing at yourself as well so I find that really I mean that's a real craft that that's being excellent at something that you know so difficult and really something that needs to be refined and Mm -hmm. and is also innate but anyway so I was I've always been a fan of his work and I got a cold call from actually from a man who uh, Dan Stutz who represented me at Shiv Hans Pictures he was our production attorney and he called me and said you would you be willing to speak to somebody about a Bill Burr movie my dear friend is producing it and wrote co-wrote it with Bill and so I got a call from Ben Tischler who talked to me about it and I was just like I don't know maybe I don't know what I'm doing right now I've been swearing off really indie indie films just in search of doing more television and doing bigger films and it's just so hard doing real independent films is just so hard Mm -hmm. but I thought all right let's do it let me just get Mm -hmm. involved and they were wonderful between Bill and Ben Tischler and Mike Bertolina Mike was also one of our producing partners and so it just became like such a nice group to work with. And, and for me, that meant everything. Mm -hmm. And then we were able to get the script into a good shape. And then we were, then we went out and I was like, well, if we could sell it, great. If we can find financing, perfect. And if not, I'm okay. We'll just, but as soon as I started, I was like, okay, I'm in, I'm in. (laughs) And we found Miramax and because of Bill's stand-up schedule, he was going on tour from April through the whole year, the rest of the year in 2022. So we had to make it in the first quarter. Mm -hmm. So this was around this time last year, Mm -hmm. we, we got Miramax involved over Christmas. We signed, we dotted the I's and crossed the T's on that deal. And we were off and running in January of 2022. And so, yeah, we made it really quickly and, and Bill decided, Bill at one point was like, I can't direct it. It's too much. And then he was like, I'm having too much fun. I am definitely directing it. I said, great, (laughs) because we don't really have time to find a new director. And so we were off to the races. 
Yeah. I mean, the cast is also, I mean, every single cast member is like, oh, I know that person. No. <laughs> well, it was really, it was really nice to have fans at the agencies because there were certain people like this wonderful woman, Faith France, who's an, a, an agent at CAA, more of a junior agent. And she just was like, there's a Bill Burr movie. And she just would call me and pitch me people every day. I was like, wow, this is amazing. And from the other <laughs> agencies too, I would just get these incoming calls of people that just wanted their clients in the movie because they really love Bill. So mm -hmm. that was a really nice way to produce a movie. So yeah. way different than other films. You're like, hey, I have something great, please. <laughs> Incoming calls. Yeah. Who's ever heard of that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I you know I'm an old mom. So I like, I definitely think there's a different intention in parenthood when you're older, but also there's that you feel the generational I mean I would say New York and LA a lot of I'm, I'm like an average age parent but right. in other exactly. parts of the country you definitely I hear friends are like I I just don't understand what they're talking about <laughs> right well no it's definitely made for a the movie was definitely made for an older generation mm -hmm. but Bill's point of view is always that we all have a lot to learn Mm -hmm. and nobody's right and nobody's wrong and everybody's right and everybody's wrong and that was always his mantra here he didn't want us to be shitting on the younger generations because mm -hmm. ultimately in the movie the older dads have to learn from the new generation in mm -hmm. order to exist and coexist and there's a lot to be learned there are ways that the Bruce Dern character is to show him like, oh, okay, I don't want to turn into somebody that's in Calcitrant or that can't, yeah. can't change. And so that's really what the message is. And so I think if you watch it with an eye, I remember having one of my interns read it early days before we made some changes, but read the script. And she said, nobody in my generation will watch this movie and nobody will appreciate it and you will mm -hmm. be canceled. I was like, okay, I don't think you're reading it the same way I'm reading it. We're we're seeing it in two different ways. But yeah, what was really pleasing and exciting was that we did we did play very well when we were doing our marketing screenings mm -hmm. and trying to figure out. And as we locked picture, we were playing across the generations and and older women, surprisingly, were the people that scored it the best. Yeah the 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 miles robbins character i want to say like denver but it wasn't denver it was like a aspen bell aspen I was close. Yes. <laughs> yes. um he he really was a great foil in the script for kind of how the generations clash and and so and how that was resolved i think i definitely i think solved some of those problems for sure like having yeah having him be subject to his own dealings or this kind of absurdity of being perfect and how you behave in all areas of your life. Exactly. Exactly. Um, um, yeah, no, he, and he was so good. He and Justin Miles were great. And also blanking on her name, but the person who played Monica in the mm -hmm. office just having no just like okay this is who my boss has to be and this is who I have to deal with but just such a a she's, great look from her you know? yeah she's so relatable of like oh my yes. gosh please just leave me alone <laughs> exactly <laughs> no I'm not going to give you a fist bump we don't do yeah. that yeah. yeah we don't no no yeah yeah and so I, I see we're coming up at the half at you know end of our time together and want to ask my last question, which is if you were to recommend a movie that I show my son, so he falls in love with cinema, what, what would you recommend? I've been trying to think of what that could be. And obviously not your two-year-olds, not when he's two, mm -hmm. but I mean, for me, there's, there's movies like Harold and Maude mm -hmm. or Being There and even, I don't know, Private Benjamin. <laughs> there's just like yeah. movies like that, that just are so great but they're older obviously older movies but they just make me so happy that films mm -hmm. exist yeah or defending your life I mean it's so fun and something that you can really he'd have to be like 20 
<laughs> when you show him those movies. Yeah. I mean, but... Harold and Maude, he could watch for sure as a teenager, though I don't think it should be with his mom. That no, movie. exactly. I think that one movie would be embarrassing with your mom. Yeah, but there's something so cool and, and a story that you wouldn't see anywhere else. Yeah. I actually bought that DVD. There's a few that I still have because I bought it because that movie meant something to me and I wanted to keep like a keepsake of the movie, which was the DVD. And and that was one of them. Yeah, from when I And one of the movies that I think um, really helped me when I was younger and I, I didn't appreciate it. I mean, I, when I was younger, maybe right in, right when I got out of college, but I didn't really appreciate it. I wouldn't have appreciated it before then, but was the Philadelphia story mm-hmm. because I didn't quite understand that people were, that even a hundred years ago, people were behaving the same as us that Mm -hmm. you see like old timey movies and like black and white and you just don't realize. And then you see how current and fresh it is. Mm -hmm. Even watching it when I was watching it in the nineties, I was just like, wow, these are, I don't know. It's just, it brought me together with those actors and feeling like it it could have been made today. Yeah, And that was mind blowing to see how people were the same back then as they are now I'm curious when you say that because there's a I mean I'm I plan on showing my son a lot of movie cinema history and cinema that I grew up with but what films like today are going to resonate in 50 years I'm like I'm so curious to know which ones are those evergreen emotionally rich alive movies that aren't just kind of so so into today's culture like that they they're universal yeah it's interesting I mean there's just I haven't really thought about the last few years movies that came out we the more I think about past lives the more I don't know if you've seen that movie yet have you seen it it's a really sweet perfect little movie that's really it's a good watch and it's just about young friendships and young love and uh, who you are and what drives you to who you become and and then whether you're able to whether you're able to go back or whether your path is your path and so it's a nice it's a nice movie with Mm -hmm. incredibly it's Celine Song's first movie actually Mm -hmm. and um, it's winning a lot of awards right now because it's so nice but yeah I mean I think there will be with the test of time. It's just, it's just finding movies that stand out that are, our film right now is really tough because the things that are making money are big blockbusters. And Mm -hmm. although I think Barbie did was wonderful and I think it did a great job. It did. And it, it it does feel like that one will stick around there. And I would love, I hope, in the next couple of years is the arc lights coming back cinemas are reopening and we're finding our way again that there are those runaway indie hits like little miss sunshine and like those kinds of movies i feel like the graduate of today (laughs) exactly exactly i really hoped that i remember being at sundance and did you were you there for the premiere of sing street Mm -hmm. were you there that year i don't remember what year it was that was probably I want to say like 2017 maybe but it I, was I worked yeah. there 2013 to 2015 and then oh great and then came yeah. back a couple of years but I needed a break <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah but it was one of those movies that we like stood up because I saw it in a theater and it mm-hmm. never got its due in the world yeah. but that it was one of those perfect screenings at Sundance yeah. where you just stand up and you're like oh my god that was so great that's the last movie that really made my jaw drop was the Sundance screening of Promising Young Woman. Mm-hmm. I, I, it was just for a first time feature film and it was so surprising and it just went there and it was beautiful and but just like hit all of those things in a fresh way. Yeah, I didn't see it in the theaters. I saw that, but I absolutely felt that way about that yeah. movie. Like we were cheering in the theater. It was like, we were, oh, you could just feel the universal response. Yeah. 
well, we're trying to keep us on time and we're a few minutes over. So I just, I want to thank you so much for joining me. I, I really love this conversation. Thank you. So nice meeting you. I yes. really appreciate you having me. If you enjoyed the conversation, please don't forget to like, and subscribe. New episodes release every Wednesday and leave a comment and let me know which movie you think I should show my son. Until next time, take care.